we definitely want to welcome everyone. We appreciate y'all attending this. I know myself, I'm excited about being able to finally release a tax credit manual to the public. It's been about seven years in the making. And every time I sent it to the legal department, it would come back and go back and forth, back and forth. Uh, the manual that we do have posted to the website, it will be tweaked a little at the end of the week, so don't take it as your final version. None of the substance will change from the manual. It's a few little typos and formatting and things like that that we caught last minute that we couldn't incorporate. It literally went live a few hours before the launch of this event. So we, uh, we worked hard at it. And I think we're, we're I, I hope that what y'all see in the final product will be something that y'all can utilize. If you are in this room, more than likely you wake up late at night and you read regulation because it's what you do for fun. Compliance people, that's usually their world is in federal regulations. Um, we are the state allocating agency, so we do have some sovereignty with regard to our position. However, one thing you're going to find with regard to our sovereignty, we don't bend the rules, but we extremely value your partnerships in this endeavor. If you see something that may be able to be improved, something that could be more efficient, we welcome that input because we want to be effective and efficient. We don't have unlimited resources, so we don't have a bunch of personnel that we can throw out in the field to audit you guys constantly. Um, and I know that's not what y'all want anyway. <laughs> But we, we do value your partnership. So this presentation is very limited in its approach. It's going to be a very high level overview, not of all the details of the manual. Keep in tune. We plan to, and we'll send out some surveys. Y'all, it will go out to the public to where y'all going to be able to give us input as to what y'all would like to see in specific training. How many days? the depth of the training, and also the training itself. I don't know if you're familiar with the QAP, but the QAP requires you guys to have certification. We plan for the training that we are to put on as part of that certification process. We do plan to offer a test at the end, like you would with other things, uh, other entities with certifications, but if you successfully pass, you could utilize that as your basis for having management experience and certifications in the tax credit world. Dion, if you could advance the slides. <laughs> oh, wow. so, so when we first started with this presentation, people always told me that I'm a born fife. Now, most people in this room, unless you're a little older, would understand what I'm talking about. Barney Fife was the one guy who sat around just ready to arrest people. He had the gun and they gave him one bullet. I said we had to put somebody with a younger generation because they won't understand Barney Fife. This is the other view of compliance. Some people feel that, well, you're going to respect our authority. That's not the approach that we in Louisiana Housing take. Uh, although we are the allocating agency, but that's not the approach. So, and although you may view us at this, keep in mind that people also view you in the same light because of the role that you play in the organizations that you're working in. Go forward, Dion. That's more. So whoever needs to know that, and that's his one bullet just waiting to nail someone. There was one episode that he actually arrested the entire town because that's the type of guy he was. <laughs> the purpose of this presentation is to give you a high level overview. It's connected directly back to the manual that we released. Uh, we'll go forward beyond. We don't have very many slides, so this will be an interactive presentation at the end. If you do have questions, write them down as we go, and then we'll answer as many as possible. At the end of the presentation, we will give out whoever wants our business cards. We will be available afterwards as well for any additional questions, and then we'll go forward from there. The manual can be 
obtained here. This is the key date. This has always, as we had people sending me emails as soon as it was released. So when do we start uploading data on WCMS and all these other questions? We expected to give you a little time to digest it. If we would need to tweak a few things, we're gonna work out those kinks. But come January 1, 2020, we expect to be full steam ahead with regard to policies, procedures connected to the compliance manual. Um, if anybody needs any technical support, of course, we will help throughout this process to go forward. You can go ahead and be honest. Introduction, we're gonna give you a very high level view of what we'll cover today. Just keep going forward. Uh, these are some of the changes that you may, in the past, you may have been able to utilize other ticks. We expect you to use an LHC approved tick, meaning it's gonna have all the data that we need to expedite our review process. That's the main goal behind it. It's not to be overly cumbersome to you, but it's to aid in uniformity and enforcement going forward. The Schedule 2A, most of you know what that is. That's basically a glorified rent roll. It shows the set-asides, bedroom counts, things of that sort. Okay. Zero income certification. Jonathan's going to talk a little bit in detail up ahead as we cover that. That's something you may not have been utilizing, but the expectation will be to use that. A certificate of unit transfer. That's not something you've seen in the past that we required. We're going to want that documentation because a lot of times that trail is broken as it goes forward. So that's one of the things that we're going to expect. A student status affidavit. Many of you as compliance people already utilize your internal documents. We have come up with a document as well that you could utilize for such purposes. Um, Self-certification policy. Again, Jonathan's going to talk in detail shortly about some of this. Some may not or may not be familiar with this inspection alignment program. I'll give you a, a very quick description if you don't know about it. HUD a few years back took an initiative and we participated in a pilot program to where if you received a REAC, a true REAC inspection, that REAC could be utilized across multiple programs from home to tax credit to CDBG to USDA to whatever else. And the goal was, contrary to people's belief in government, was to become more efficient. That you wouldn't have RD coming one week, then LHC coming the next week, then another entity coming in the following week. <coughs> so this alignment program works. And I'm going to touch on it later on to show how you can help us connect some of those dots to be more efficient with regard to the process. Not my favorite, the next one, sample size changes. I don't make the rules, I just play in the game that they give us. So February 26, IRS implemented some new rules with regard to unit sample sizes. It's no longer 20%. It's based on the total number in the project. And we'll cover that a little bit later on as well. Um, WCMS, that's our web-based compliance system. Most of you already update your data into this system. We expect this system to broaden out further and be utilized even from a desk audit perspective. That you wouldn't have an auditor coming to you, that you would send the documents to the auditor and they'd be able to review it from that, from that side. Especially if you got a physical review that was conducted by a REAC inspector, then you can decouple and you can separate the inspections. And then finally, a hot topic lately, average income tests. Income averaging is how most people know that term. Um, I'll give you a very sneak peek. It's in the next QAP as being allowed. So we're going there. It wasn't going there before, but it is the law, and we have no choice but to oblige and follow the law. Go forward, Dion. Yeah. We're talking about the 8609s. Most of you are very familiar with the 8609s. This form once fully executed, needs to be turned back 
two plus. And the reason being is that little section A, A, B, with regard to whether you can treat it as a project or whether or not it's treated as individual buildings, and that affects your unit transfer abilities. We as the agency will also expect if you're choosing income averaging as your method for compliance, <coughs> that you will be selecting 8B, clicking yes, that you're treating it as a project and not standalone buildings because to treat the standalone bins in that process would be a nightmare for compliance and you'd find yourself always out of compliance because it'd be hard to get the next available unit that meets the correct set aside in that process. Um, and again, if you have questions with regard to that, we'll give that back to you at the end. All right, so just to kind of um, add a little bit to what Todd was saying about the 86 of the <coughs> over on that, um, we need copies back. That's always been important. That's not new to this manual. What happens is a lot of times when the 8609s are completely executed by the developer, they're not sent back to LHC and the compliance department doesn't have a copy. So line eight, like Todd was talking about, where you select whether or not it's a multiple building project, we need that information and having to go to the IRS makes the whole process kind of cumbersome. So for a lot of the properties in our portfolio right now, we may not have fully executed 8609s on file. If we don't, my compliance monitors will probably ask you for them at your next compliance review. So be ready to obtain those. And if you want to avoid that step in the process, you can probably just get copies of them and go ahead and send them to us. Can I add something to that? That's yeah. also a part of the annual um, submission requirements. If uh, 8609s have not been submitted to the agency, that they should be submitted at that time or before. But it's a part of the uh, annual submission requirements as well if they have not been provided. Um, so I wanted to take a minute to talk about what Todd mentioned earlier. The QAP requires tax credit certification for property managers and house developers when we're, uh, when we're funding tax credit properties. Um, so we went ahead and put that in this manual as a requirement. We left it, we kind of painted it with a broad brush. Um, we're not real specific. It says that all personnel responsible for compliance at tax credit properties need to have a tax credit certification. We didn't get into uh, where that certification needs to come from or what that certification needs to cover, but you do need to have the certification. Uh, it says all personnel responsible in the manual. Um, so if you've got, it, it, that basically means that property managers need to have some type of tax credit certification and know what's going on. We don't necessarily expect every leasing agent and every assistant manager to have a tax credit certification. However, if you have a leasing agent who's responsible for certifying qualified units of the property, they need to have a certification. Um, you'll see in the manual that it does say that the certification needs to be maintained on site. So if our managers are there and they're running into a lot of problems and they see that maybe the manager didn't, didn't really grasp the program, they may ask about the certification and ask to see it. So once you've got that certification, keep it on site. Um, I know some of our developers in the state have one <laughs> compliance person who handles their portfolio and, and reviews a lot of things in the state. Um, so it's good that that person has certification. Most of those people do have those certifications, but we need people at the property level to have it as well. It's, um, it just cuts down on a lot of <coughs> down the road. Um, so the training, like I said in the manual, we don't specify where the training needs to come from. Um, most folks are familiar with Nietzsche's training. They do a really good presentation and they offer certification. We list several more in the manual. There are options. We don't require any of them. They're just suggestions for someone who's looking for a place to go to get a certification. That being said, uh, like Todd said earlier, we're going to offer some training specific to this manual later this year. Hopefully we'll be doing that at least annually going forward. And uh, that certification will qualify with this requirement so if you attend our certification and, and we're going to keep that cost at a minimum and I'm, I'm hoping maybe it, it won't be a cost to developers there won't be a cost to attend that training um, we'll, so we we'll use it as a guinea pig fee that'll be the first <laughs> round and we'll see how that works out. i think if there's any cost to it it would just be to recoup whatever the cost is so that we're not you know 
going over the budget on our end, but uh, we're not we're not trying to get rich or retire on it. So you know, it'll be a minimal cost if there's anything. So if that helps you guys out, we get your initial certification goes to the Mm -hmm. um, if that helps out getting your initial certifications under your belt and then you want to move forward with some others that that might be something to look for and that training will be specific to this manual to this state to LHC and to the new requirements that we're putting in place here the expectation oh, yeah, yeah. not one and done that was yeah so in the manual you will also see um, that there's a requirement that you continue to get training one at least once every three years and that's because of things like this change in unit size that just got put in place just in February we had some big changes to the program and so if managers aren't aware of that that can lead to some compliance problems that we would just like to avoid so we are going to require about once every three years that managers will be certified so you've got a current certification in the program so heretofore there has not been a lot of bite after you get out of the initial compliance period as far as um, maintaining compliance and enforcement so what we've done in this manual is um, we put some of that in place so there are some sanctions now in the extended use period if you fall out of compliance um, so everybody knows I think everybody knows that once you hit that second 15 year period the extended use period um, there are no more 8823s. We don't notify the IRS of non-compliance anymore. So it, it all falls to the state, it all falls to LHC. And the responsibility is on us to, make, to maintain compliance in that second 15 years. Um, so you know, before this, it, we just said that, you know, you, you may be subject to, to sanctions of the court, which means, you know, we may sue. Uh, I don't think we've ever done that. Um, so in, in this manual now, We've done three things in addition to judicial and, and civil proceedings that, that can take place. Um, we are going to, well, we already have a list of non-compliant properties. Properties will now be placed in a not in good standing category. Um, if you are in not in good standing, you may not be funded. Uh, applications, future applications for funding are subject to automatic denial. That list of properties not in good standing is also subject to being published on the website, which means it's public information. Uh, so when developers apply for funds in other states, a lot of times we'll get requests uh, from those states to ask, are there any properties that this developer has in your state that are not in compliance? We fill that out and send it back. That information will now be public knowledge. If you have a property that is not in good standing, it will be published to the website and other states and other people that are looking into funding, uh, other applications that you have in, in other units of government and other places will be able to see that. Um, and you know, the, the ability for LHC to sue for specific performance is still there as well. Um, so those are, those are the three big things to watch out for now in the extended use period. Um, uh, also, we'll get into certifications and that kind of thing. We LHC has never really changed the rules of the program for the extended use period. There's other states that don't require recertifications or they, they relax the requirements in the extended use period, and we haven't really done that. I don't, we haven't even really done that for the, the student status rule. And so be aware that we are still enforcing the program all the way through the second 15 years. And whatever some properties it's even longer than that now with um, with special conditions so all of that still applies and these three <laughs> items that i just mentioned that apply now to the extended use period also apply to the entire affordability period so your first 15 years as well not just the extended use period so be aware that if you're not in compliance and you've got an 8823 file and you just well they've already filed the 8823 and i'm in year 14 so i don't care um you will still be placed on the the not in good standing list and, and all these other sanctions will still apply even in the initial 14 years. Um, what I would like to say with regard to the extended use policy, um, it's not in the manual, but we have been given permission to insert it in the manual. In this extended use period, we have the ability as the allocating agency to relax some of the rules. We expect and have gotten permission from our executive director and our executive council that if you're good players during this period, you may be put on a five-year cycle of review instead of a three-year cycle of review. So there could be rewards for good behavior during this period. 
Uh, we will be publishing that into the manual, so you're going to have it in writing. But I wanted to just give y'all a tidbit that they gave us permission. <laughs> uh, so the certification of unit transfer, this is a required form. And, and just while I'm here, real quick, uh, the list of forms that Todd went over briefly at the beginning, those are all now required forms for our state. Before, we haven't specified any forms, that, any specific forms that you needed to use. We, you know, you have to use a TIG, but we didn't say which TIG. Um, the only thing that we sort of did that with was the Schedule 2A, and that's because that's a form that's specific to our state. There's not another one anywhere. Uh, student status, zero income affidavits, uh, that whole list of stuff. They were There's several versions of those forms that folks have used. Now we are saying that you need to use these specific forms. They're in the appendix to the manual. They're on our website. Um, starting in January, January 1st of 2020, all this stuff will, will take effect, and um, you need to use those specific forms. One of those forms is the certification of unit transfer. This is to help us track um, unit status at property, so it helps us apply the next available unit rule and look at over income units and transfers and that kind of thing. Um, it's also important in um, multiple building transfers, so when tenants are transferring between buildings. So even 100% tax credit properties where you think the unit transfer may not be quite so important, it still is. Uh, it goes back to, Todd mentioned line 8 on the 8609 earlier, whether or not you've selected um, A or B there, and whether or not it's a multiple building project affects those between building transfers. So we've had trouble in the past tracking that. So this certification of unit transfer will go into the file for any household that transfers units inside of a project or between buildings. Um, this will also go along with some other documentation that I'll talk about in a little bit to help us track all of that stuff. I think that's yours. Okay. Um, it occurred to me during one of our roundtable discussions that we actually solved the problem that was becoming a problem. And what I mean by that is we were discussing some of the barriers that have occurred in affordable housing and there's a gap in service with regard to individuals. And what I mean by that is, yes, we serve the extremely low, we serve the 60 percenters, but then there's that gap between that 60% and perhaps 80% of individuals who still need the help, they need the lower rents in order to, so that they can make the next steps in their life forward, but it's not there, that was missing. This average income test that's now allowed will solve some of that. It'll be a little more complicated for you as compliance people it'll be a heck of a lot more complicated for our compliance auditors to go to verify set-asides. We plan to use electronics to the best of our abilities to help with the compliance testing with regard to some of this. Um, but just keep it in mind that if you're not fully educated in the processes, you may want to start to educate yourself as to how this truly works. We will not allow individuals to view them as individual buildings. They need to be treated as projects in order to aid with that compliance because your average still has to be 60 or below when you put them all together to 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80 percent. Um, and as you can see, I talk with my hands because I'm from way down the bayou. Um, some people say that I need the subtitles because of my accent <laughs> in the process. <laughs> but most people from Louisiana can understand me. Um, the income averaging also, originally in the next QAP, we plan to put that we would view it as pro rata, rata meaning that you have to equally di distribute the bedroom sizes because what some states have witnessed happening is that the higher AMIs, the 80 percent, they were giving them to the four bedroom units, thus capturing higher rents, and then giving all the 20 percent, we're getting the one bedrooms and efficiencies in the process. We didn't put it in the QAP, and the reason being is because you still have the fair housing principles that will apply. We don't need to tell you to fairly treat the process, because you could result in a 
Fair, Fair housing claim right. if you would be steering these poorer people to the one bedroom units and giving the 80 percent to the four bedroom units. Habitability, I'll just touch a little bit with exigent health and safety. Um, see all that? That's pulling <laughs> wires up there. <laughs> it's out of reach, so it wouldn't be considered a violation. But anyway, <coughs> that's what exigent health and safety usually is. You're smoke detectors, fire extinguishers. We expect, and it's in the manual, immediate attention to these items if it's an exigent health and safety. HUD also, from a REACT perspective, expects the same. In the past, we've given you 48 hours, 72 hours to give the evidence back, but we aligned ourselves with HUD that we expect immediate, that's the way it's termed, attention to these items because they are serious life safety items and we take it very seriously what you view as immediate when we leave is up to you but our view is that immediate attention and then the evidence has to come back to the agency for correction uh, similar process to with the HUD requirements one of the things that's new here is a policy on adding new household members in the first six months of occupancy for a household um, initially <laughs> When we wrote this policy for this manual, and this, this has been sort of an issue for a long time, um, our, our initial policy said that we were just not going to allow adding new members in the first six months, just not at all. Um, inside the first six months, whoever qualified initially is what the household was going to be, and that was it. Uh, that eliminates a lot of compliance issues for us and a lot of confusion. We got a little bit of feedback, and uh, Todd and I went back and forth with it a little bit, and what came out in the manual is that we will allow adding household members in the first six months. However, if a new household member is added in the first six months of occupancy by a new household, they have to re-qualify as an initial move-in at the income limit. Um, <laughs> right, right, that's, that's going to create some problems for some households. Uh, this is a result of some, some opinions and some legislation from the IRS that this allows manipulation of the rules. This helps us to monitor for manipulation of the rules. It's too easy for somebody to move in and say, I'm separated from my husband. They get in, they're qualified because she's getting child support for $100 a month and a, a letter that says, you know, yeah, I'm giving this my ex-wife $100 a month and that's the only income she has. And then three months down the road, the husband moves in. Suddenly, they're making sixty thousand dollars a year. I saw that when I was on the road repeatedly. I can't tell you how many times. We didn't have a policy to do anything about it, and at the time, we really didn't have the teeth to enforce it. Well, now we do, um, and we're responsible as a state. The IRS has said we're responsible for monitoring manipulation of program rules, and so this this ends that. So please be aware of that policy at your properties because this is going to. This is going to create some confusion with some property managers, I think. Up until now, we have not required a specific tick in this state. This is to help expedite the monitoring process and keep our compliance officers not at your property for so long, um, which I know you guys are happy to have us out of your office. So now we are going to require it, and it's the tick that most of you are already using. Um, the issue we're running into is there were about 10 different ticks being used around the state at different properties. Some people were using the HUD 5.8 as a tick. But we didn't specify as long as it had the information on it that we needed, we went with it. Um, it makes the monitoring visit a lot longer because our guys have to flip back and forth and try and find information on the form that they're not familiar with. This way, when we're in your office going through your files, we know exactly where the information is on the tick. And, um, I, a lot of you probably know Jeff Heavey. He's been doing this for a long time. I did this for a long time with this tick. I could get through a file in about, I don't know, if it's a clean file and there's no findings, a minute and a half. I mean, I, I can go through it. I can hit it and be done with it. I see that everything's there. With a tick I'm not familiar with, I'm going to spend 10 or 15 minutes on the file trying to find everything. So this creates a lot of efficiencies for us. Um, it is in the appendix to the manual, so you shouldn't have any problem finding it. Most of you are probably already using it anyway because it was the most common tick. Now, we did require, we, it says in the manual that um, we were going to require an LHC approved tick. It does not say that this will be the only LHC approved tick. So if there is another one 
that we find is more efficient or as efficient that some property managers want to use, we may so there may be more than one approved ticket at some point in the future. We left that possibility in there because we know not everybody operates the same. But right now, until we find something that works as well or better than this, this is it. Self-certifications and recertifications. I uh, wanted to spend a few minutes on this. This will probably be the biggest clarification for a lot of you. Um, let's see, back in, I think, 2008, if I remember right, yeah, uh, the IRS did away with the requirement to recertify households at projects that are 100% tax credit. Uh, LHC did not, and there was some confusion about that for a few years. Some folks were just not doing recertifications if they had 100% tax credit property. Um, we, we never eliminated that in this state. What we did was we modified it. There was some written policy, but it led to some confusion, and it's never been really clear. So we took this opportunity to make certain that we clarified the recertification policy and the self-certification policy for properties that are 100% tax credit and tax credit only. If you have layered funding, you are still required to do full recertifications annually for all of your households. <laughs> Uh, so if there's uh, home funds layered in, uh, any, any um, RD, any of our other stuff, any other programs that are not funded by LHC, um, we're looking for full recertifications. Now, uh, this goes back to the TIC a little bit because the way we're doing this is we are, you're still required to use this TIC. This is still the approved TIC, and when you're using, there's no self-certification form, it's the TIC. The TIC has all of the information on it that you need for a self-certification. It's got income and asset verification. It verifies names and ages of household members, the number of household members, and it lists the student status on it. Those are the primary elements that we're looking for. Um, so we're still going to use this TIC. You simply need to have the tenant come in, make sure that the information on it is complete, whether your manager fills it out or the tenant fills it out. It, it doesn't really matter as long as the information on it is correct and the tenant signs and dates it, you need every household member who is of the age of majority. So anybody over 18 in the household still needs to sign the self-certification and it's valid. Um, the one thing you will need in addition to the TIC for a self-certification is a student status verification. We're still gonna need student status verifications to go along with this. Other than that, any other source documentation you don't need. Um, so no more third-party verifications when you're doing a self-certification in Louisiana. That's been our policy. We just clarified it here and put it in writing. Very clear for everybody. Um, if you have any emails or any letters that contradict what is in this manual, they are no longer Throw them out, delete them. You don't show up to me when I show up at your property because they don't count anymore. Right. Unless from this day forward you get an email from me. Right. And I'm not contradicting this, and if yeah. Todd does, that's up to him. Um, but y'all know exactly what I'm talking about and where it came from. Throw it away. One caveat to this recertification policy that is new, and then y'all, it's, it's kind of a detail, but pay attention to it. At the first anniversary of the move-in date, you must do a full recertification. So just because they're certified the first time doesn't mean you're done. You have to do a full recertification with third-party documents, source documentation, the whole deal at the first anniversary. After the first anniversary of move-in, self-certifications are fine. You just need to use the tip. If anybody has any questions, let me know. Thank you. So, the next step. so in the next step, I thought to myself, how do I break this to the crowd unless they know about the rules? 15-day um, notice of review and a 48-hour notice of fall inspection. Sounds a little restrictive, isn't it? But for me, not to get in trouble, I will read directly from the Federal Register. These final sh regulations shorten the reasonable notice requirement to a 15-day notice that a project will experience an upcoming physical inspection or review of low-income certification. The Treasury Department and Internal Revenue Service believe that the 15-day notice period gives building owners reasonable notice that a review of low-income certifications will occur and gives building owners and tenants reasonable notice that a project will be inspected and that low-income units 
will be inspected if they are in the random sample that will be decided later. Clarification on the 15 day. They kept on writing, okay? This is not my writing. <laughs> Meaning, they didn't just write it once, they recapped it later. Meaning of reasonable notice. For the purposes of this section, reasonable notice is generally, that's our little magic word, generally, okay? But you're gonna see why it's not really a magic word. <laughs> generally, no more than 15 days. It's not 15 day notice required. It's no more than 15 day notice. The notice period begins on the date the agency informs the owner that an on-site inspection of a project and low-income units or low-income certification review will occur. Notice of more than 15 days, however, may be reasonable in extraordinary circumstances that are beyond an agency's control and that prevent an agency from carrying out within 15 days an on-site inspection or low-income certification review. They even specify the extraordinary conditions, okay? <laughs> so I'm not the one inv inventing this. Please feel free after this presentation to email me and I will send you a copy of the regulation for your own personal benefit. It actually puts a strain on us in this process because we manage a field team. You know how hard it is when you're in the field to send out notices of inspection? It, it's cumbersome if that's what you're doing as a field team. So we're gonna probably be the ones that's mostly out of compliance in this process, but we're gonna not try to be. We will try to give you the 15 day notice um, if at all possible. Sometimes it may be a little more, sometimes a little less, but keep in mind, don't get angry at me or Jonathan or any of the compliance staff in this process. It's not me. Current Federal Regulation Part 26, 1.42, issued February 26, 2019. So that's where it's coming from. The 48-hour notice of file inspection. This has come about from us trying to become more streamlined in the process. And granted, even with this 48-hour notice, it's not a solid 48-hour window. We will work with you. We expect the uploads to begin within a 48 hour period. We understand technology sometimes crashes, things happen, but if you're in contact with us through this process, we will work with you. We're not gonna hold your feet to the fire and find you out of compliance because at 48 hours and three seconds, you are now out of compliance. This process is specifically <laughs> connected to desk review. If you have a REAC and we choose to do a desk review of the, the tenant certifications, it's going to be done through this process. The uploads will occur on our web-based compliance monitoring system. Most of you knew it, know it as WCMS. So we'll have a lot of interaction electronically through this process. Um, and if you're uploading most of your stuff like you're supposed to on an annual basis, a lot of the data will already be there, so you may have to just upload supplemental data connected to support the file. So that's what we'll be looking for at that point in time. I wanted to take a few minutes to spend on the documents that we look at when we come to review your property. Um, in the manual, <coughs> there is a list of about 11 documents that need to be available for inspection. Um, I'll say right now, I don't know how many of you had actually had a chance to get through the manual and look at it all yet, but of those 11, the first two are documents that are still being developed. Uh, we went ahead and put them in the manual because we expect to use them before long, um, but they're still in development. So when you get a letter, when you read this manual and then you uh, get a letter saying that we're coming out there and you start getting your documents together and you look at those and you go, well, what are those? I don't have those. Don't worry about them. Um, until we request them specifically, I wouldn't worry about them too much. Uh, what I want to focus on, though, are some of the documents that we currently request. There's 11 of them in here, that, and there's some things that we don't ask for that you should have on file at your property just as a matter of regular business. Um, 
be sure that those things, and they're listed in the manual, just please be sure that those things are available and, and easy to access when we come on the property in case we need to look at them. The things that we don't always need, but occasionally we do, and if, if you don't have them or don't have access to them, it's hard for us to, to verify that you're in compliance with program rules. Um, the things that I did want to focus on are a couple things. The rent roll, everybody's familiar with the rent roll. Everybody knows how that works. Please have it available when our guys are on site. It helps us track um, some income. It helps us verify information on the Schedule 2A. It helps us look at next available unit rules, over income rules, all that kind of stuff. A lot of times property managers just don't have it available and it, it adds to the time that we're on site. It, it creates compliance issues that are not really compliance issues. Uh, we've had it put in, in compliance reports as findings when it really wasn't a finding, they just didn't have the documentation to, to verify. Um, not having the documentation is a finding. Um, what I did want to spend a couple minutes on is the Schedule 2A. I wanted to emphasize the Schedule 2A. It is a document specific to Louisiana. I think probably everybody in this room knows what it is, um, at least those of you who have been around for a little bit. Um, so, y'all know I was on the road for a while and did property reviews on site and I supervise the staff that's out there now. When I was on the road doing uh, on the ground property reviews, when I sent out a letter and I got a call back from the property manager and the first question was, what's the schedule 2A? I immediately knew this review was not going to go well. <laughs> All right. Please be sure you know what the Schedule 2A is. I know it's specific to Louisiana. The, the name of the document is odd, and there's a history to it. It comes from way back when this agency first started, and it was part of a larger document. The name has just never been changed. Everybody's familiar with that name at this point, so I'm not going to change it now. It's our secret little code. It's, it's confusing. Y'all know it. It's confusing enough. <laughs> Uh, so I'm not going to change it and confuse everybody even more, but uh, it helps us to verify your set-asides um, which and also some of your special conditions. Uh, it helps us, again, to look at things like the next available unit rule, over income situations. Primarily, it helps us verify that you're meeting your set-asides. Uh, and it needs to match. Please be sure that it matches your rent roll. We look at it and it varies if there's a unit that varies from what's on the rent roll that throws up all kinds of red flags and we're going to look really close at those units. So be sure that it's accurate and up to date and that it matches your rent roll and that they are um, one sheet, you'll notice there's a place for a bin number on top of the Schedule 2A, one page per building, which means if you've got a small subdivision full of 50 single family homes, you should have 50 Schedule 2As in there. There should be, you can't list every one of them on one sheet, even though it seems much more efficient. We need to track these by bin number, by building number, so that we can track your compliance. Um, and if you guys have any questions on the Schedule 2A, there is um, the Schedule 2A and instructions for completing it in the appendix to this manual. If anybody calls me and asks me what's the Schedule 2A or how to fill it out, I'm just going to direct them to the manual because it's in there. So. Be familiar with it, let your property managers know it's in there. Now, if you have problems with the instructions and you don't understand the instructions, feel free to call me. I will explain the instructions if you've already looked at them and just don't understand them. So the other couple of things here that I'm just going to mention real quick with regard to documentation is um, the waiting list. If you have 100% uh, filled property and you have a waiting list, we need to be able to just look at it and verify. We, we're going to pull a little bit of information off of that and utility allowance documentation. Um, most of the time we're going to look at your files and we're going to see the utility allowance and if it looks in line we're not going to question it a whole lot. If utility allowances look high or if they look out of line or if, you, if we start running into a lot of over income issues at a property which occasionally we run into properties where it looks like 80% of the units are over income, we need to be able to verify the utility allowance where it came from and that, that everything's above board with that. So please have the documentation, source documentation from the utility allowance available for review whenever we're at the property. So I'll take on the next two items with regard to inspection streamlining. This will be a critical aspect, especially with the next item, talking about monitoring sample sizes, as to how we proceed efficiently with monitoring our entire portfolio. We have right at a thousand different developments in our portfolio and it's growing. We have 
54,000 units in our portfolio and it's growing, we have four specialists to cover that. So it's a very big workload. However, with regard to inspection streamlining, tell your team members, if the property gets a REAC inspection, alert our inspector. Whoever the auditor is, the compliance officer, let them know. The rules have allowed for a decoupling of the inspection process from the tenant income and file review. The rules allow for it. It is now a permanent fixture in the rules. Now, in that process, we'll talk a little more about what the other repercussions from the rules are, but keep in mind, if it's a REACT that's been scored, run through the HUD systems, it counts for us, it counts for HUD, it counts for RD, if they accept it, but they are part of the pilot program. Um, and in another list of partners that we have, we have about nine federal partners that recognize that we irritate y'all way too much. <laughs> if we can do one and done, and it's uniform, scored, we accept REACTs because most of our team are HUD REACT certified inspectors, and it is tough to remain a HUD REACT certified inspector. It's tough to run a report through the HUD systems because there's engineers who constantly pick at it, and then you get, now they send us a little report on your performance after the fact to let you know what you missed, didn't miss, and then it three strikes you out, you gotta go back through the whole process of getting trained again, getting certified again, and I don't know if you ever had a HUD QA over your neck for three days straight. It's not a very <laughs> fun thing to do, but that's the process and why we respect these REACT reports as being a statistically valid physical inspection report. Personally, I think they got a little confused in this process because they took out the REACT tables. Dion, do we have the chart? I think we put the slide on the chart. They took the REACT physical inspection tables and then now put it where low income certification review. So those REACT numbers, or sample size numbers, have now become your file size numbers. If you have a REACT inspection, when we do the file review, it cannot be the same units because then you would be beyond that 15-day reasonable notice period that they don't allow you to get notice of the inspections. So we can decouple it. The biggest issue with this, I wish every project was 10,000 units because we only got 27 units to sample. <laughs> but when we analyzed our portfolio, most of our projects fell somewhere around 32 to 40 units. So instead of 20% of 30, which is six units, we've got 15 now. That's the reason for us looking for more efficiencies when perhaps using electronic systems to do a lot of our compliance testing and then getting these REACT reports, then we can separate that, count that as our file review, and it's okay. Also, if it's a REACT, it don't, keep this in mind, it does not have to occur during the same year. The decoupling has allowed it, because both of them go on a three-year cycle. If you score good, you every three years. If you don't score well with a REACT, they see annually, which is more restrictive than the tax credit every three years. So we accept it from both sides of it. Um, this is in our manual. It's also in our next QAP. So expect this coming January 1, 2020. NCSHA is planning to try to debate some of this, but my theory is that a lot of this occurred during a government shutdown. And they snuck some stuff in there, and I don't think that it's coming out. So we just assume smile and move on, and it'll be what it'll be. But it'll be based on the total number of units. If we're doing the inspection in this process, 
we're not going to probably separate the physical from the file. We'll probably keep it together, and it's still at our discretion as the allocating agency. But if we're utilizing the REACT, it's going to have to be a separate unit selection. Or if we choose a few, so be it. You just don't want to know whether or not we're choosing some of that or not. But it will be based on this sample chart that you see here. I'll let Jonathan conclude with the next two things, and then we'll open it back up to you as the audience for any questions, OK? Um, I just want to piggyback real quick on what Todd was saying about the sample size increase. So I know you guys don't like it. We like it even less. We were short staffed before to get all this monitoring done. That increase in sample size represents a 50% increase in our workload. Uh, it's going to be tough for a little while until we can get staffed up and get some folks trained up to come out and monitor you guys. Plus, That's, they don't let us bump the fees up. And, and we don't get anything <laughs> extra for doing it. Um, so look, that's the reason for a lot of these, the required tick and some of these other efficiencies that we're putting in here so that we can get through these things pretty quickly. Um, we don't want to be on site taking up your time when you guys can be leasing units. And we've got other things to do. We have a huge workload now. The number of units that we have to monitor every year is almost, it borders on ridiculous at this point. So until we can get staffed up, we've, we've got our plates full. So please excuse us if we're brief with you when we're on site. We're trying to get in, get out, and get to the next property. My guys are probably seeing three properties that day. So just please bear with us and try to have documents ready when we come in. Um, so the next thing I wanted to touch on is the continuous unit listing. Um, this is something that's new. This is another one of the, the documents that we're going to require um, be kept on file for tenants. Um, what we're trying this this goes back to the certification of unit transfer It's part of that it all fits together kind of pieces of the puzzle so that we can better track next available unit rules and over income units and unit transfers we didn't have any mechanism in place for tracking that kind of stuff prior to this um, so we don't specify in the manual how this continuous unit listing needs to look um, we have not developed a form for it this is something that we're going to leave to property managers and managing agents to determine for themselves. You all have your own business practices. You all have your own way of doing things that work well for you. Um, some of you are using Yardi, some of you are not. So I, my initial thought is that this will be some type of spreadsheet that you guys develop at the property level and keep it on file. Whatever works best for you. What we need is something and you'll see in the manual there's a set of about a dozen data points that need to be reflected on this report what we need is a report that reflects those 11 data points and 11 12 something like that and are, and is easy to follow so that we can see when a household moves out of the unit and into the next unit or when a household moves out of a unit and the unit is made ready and a new household moves in um, this helps us to verify that low income tax credit units are being leased before market rate units. Uh, it helps us verify in, in mixed income properties. It helps us verify, like I said earlier, and I've mentioned this two or three times today, the next available unit rule, um, which was hard for us to track before. So be thinking about that. That's something that is going to be effective January 2020, so it's coming up, and we're going to be looking for that on site at properties. So be thinking about how you want that to work at your properties because um, we will definitely be looking at it. If you have any questions about it as you're going through the process and kind of developing this, if you don't already have something, if some, some properties already have something like this in place. If you don't already have something in place, uh, feel free to call me if you've got any questions about what you think is going to work or not work when we come out on site. I, I don't mind helping you all kind of work through it if you, if you want me to. If you don't want me to, that's, that's fine too. Last thing I wanted to touch on here is um, file maintenance and record keeping. So a couple of points. The, the one thing in the manual that we put in there that is important is that um, we're not allowing white out. We never have. Now it's in writing. <laughs> so when your property manager sticks white out on something and you go back and tell them you can't put white out on something and your property manager wants to argue, you can pull out the manual and say, look, LHC said don't put white out on anything. <laughs> um, one line through it, if, the tenant, if it's a tenant change, have the tenant initial it or sign it. If it's something that your manager had to do, have them initial it or sign it. Keep it on the document. Uh, any certification should not be altered at all. It can be clarified or re-verified. That's very specifically stated in the manual. Clarification or a new verification, don't alter it. 
In other words, don't use white out. I think that that pretty much sums up uh, what I've got. Don, you got anything else? No, we turn it over to y'all. <coughs> so, any questions with regard to what y'all heard today? So the, so for 100% tax credit property, the very first year they have to do a full certification. Has that always been required? Or is that a no, new requirement? That's new. Okay. That's new. Right. Previously we just said that you needed to do a self certification mm -hmm. in the extended use. Now, period. To do a full now we need a full recertification at the first annual. Mm -hmm. After that, we get self certification. Anybody else? I know you said that continuous unit listing wasn't going to go into effect until 2020, but how many years back are you looking for information for that? Um, that's a good question. I think probably the last three years. I don't think we want to go back too far. Um, we need to see that those units are are continuously <coughs> occupied or not and how they transferred for probably the previous three years. And we're not going to be real hard to line about that. Um, we need a couple of years at least. Um, if you can, I think three years is, is reasonable. If anybody has any trouble getting three years of listings, uh, call me and we'll, we'll work on that. It, it, we didn't really specify that in the manual because as we move forward, it won't be an issue because you know three years from now, everybody will have three years worth of documentation in there at a minimum, so yes? When you were speaking about the um, policy change surrounding adding household members within the first six months, does that also apply to removing household members within the first six months? No. No. The, the reason behind that is because adding household members can cause an over-income situation. Mm -hmm. If someone moves out, it, it doesn't cause an over-income situation, so no. In regards to the recertification waiver that kicks in after the first full research, I, I see in the compliance manual that it states that if you have a, a market unit that well, let me let you elaborate as far as that so that, that policy is for the, the self certification policy it is for 100% tax credit properties and tax credit only. Mm -hmm. If you have any layered funding or if you have any market rate units in the property, you're still doing full recertification. And that's because we run into an issue with next available unit and over income and all those kind of things. So that's for only 100% tax credit properties and tax credit only, no other funding involved. Okay, so for the non-revenue staff unit that has been approved through the application process, mm -hmm. are you treating that as that market unit or can we no. say that's still 100%? No. Yeah, that, that's still, because that would be treated as a common use area and it's part of the applicable fraction as common use. It's a functionally related unit. Right, right. So it's not it's not a market rate unit because you're not charging market rents for it. Now, if you're charging market rents for it, we're probably going to call it a market rate unit, and then you're going to have an issue because it's um, no longer counted in your applicable fraction, and if you're 100 percent property, so it leads to some other issues. But uh, not. Yes. Louisiana, you, um, when you're talking about household members, mm -hmm. and then if somebody was pregnant but then not pregnant because had some issues with uh, miscarriage, or now they apply uh, with two household members, but they would have never qualified for the one, but now they're pregnant. Those cases, I think we're probably going to have to handle on a case by case basis. So we can't really call that non compliance. I mean, because they do recognize <laughs> the child right. being able to be counted. So you would, in the qualification, you would qualify them. And then when you come for your next cycle, then it wouldn't be reflected yeah. in that next. When you're qualifying year. a unit, an unborn child counts as a household member. And like I said before, removing a household member. We haven't addressed that. That's not an issue until the household members are removed. Yeah, no, I, 